Hello everyone, myself Dr. Mithusha Verma, I'm a consultant etiologist uh, at Nanavati Max Super Specialty Hospital, Mumbai. And the topic which we are going to discuss in the next 15-20 minutes is anatomy of CSF spaces and cisterns. So this is something which all of us already know, but it's going to be a quick revision with few important highlights. So before we begin, I would like to thank all the organizers of this 21st MRI teaching course uh, for their efforts and especially I would like to thank Dr. Deepak Patkar sir for all the radiology knowledge which I have gained. So uh, these are the headings under which we are going to discuss this topic today. So uh, first of all we would uh, like to revise the CSF physiology, then CSF flow pathway, then CSF spaces and systems, important ones and their clinical applications. So as we all know, CSF is a clear watery fluid that fills the ventricle of the brain and the subarachnoid spaces. So the normal CSF pressure is around 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury in adults, which is 65 to 195 millimeters of water. This is important to know because sometimes we get the reports of CSF pressure to understand whether it is a high pressure state or a low pressure state by the measurements. Site of CSF origin is the choroid plexus, even the brain parenchyma and the spinal cord, as well as the ependymal lining of the ventricles. See, uh, we all know the CSF uh, flow pathway, but just a revision. So from the lateral ventricles after the uh, production of the CSF, mainly through the choroid plexus, the CSF flows into the third ventricle and the passage is the foramen of Monroe. So this is a few mnemonics which they have mentioned in the bracket. So uh, Monroe is the first foramen after which from the third ventricle via the aqueduct of Sylvius, the CSF flows into the fourth ventricle as we see on the mid sagittal this is the side where we are planning our uh, csf velocity analysis studies so that we will uh, see with few slides and then afterwards from the fourth ventricle the csf flows via the foramen of mckendy which is a median aperture and also through the two lateral apertures these are the foramen of lushkas and then a part of the csf also flows through the central uh, canal into the spinal cord region. After this flow, uh, it is the portion of CSF absorption which takes place and there are three recognized routes through which the CSF absorption occurs. One is uh, through the arachnoid granulations uh, via the subarachnoid spaces which ultimately brings the CSF into the cerebral venous system. Second is through minute channels so that passes through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and the third is the lymphatic system. So something important is that these subarachnoid uh, granulations or space uh, arachnoid granulations they are connecting the subarachnoid space with the sinuses via the dura matter. So these are actually piercing the dura matter and then they are communicating with the dural venous sinuses where they are ultimately draining the CSF. So this red line is the pia matter which is uh, just covering the cortex. Above this the green band is the subarachnoid space which is lined by the arachnoid membrane. This subarachnoid space is in continuity via these piercing channels, the blue thing is the dura and then they are continuing into the venous sinuses. So CSF is constantly being getting produced at a secretion rate of 0.2 to 0.7 ml per minute. These values are sometimes important to know. So this is like a quick revision. And so in a day around 600 to 700 ml of newly produced CSF, is there in the system and since the total volume of CSF averages 150 to 270 ml at a time this means that the entire volume of CSF is replaced around four times per day. There is no functional communication between the ventricles and the subarachnoid spaces in any region except from the fourth ventricle. And there are two theories or there are two components through which the CSF circulation may be explained. One is the bulk flow and the second is the pulse style flow. So bulk flow is uh, consistent of the CSF flow through the fourth ventricle and finally into the spinal canal. Whereas the pulse style flow consists of the theory where we consider that during the cardiac phases of systole and diastole, the CSF also moves back and forth. 
And this forms the uh, basis of what we call the CSF flow or CSF velocity analysis using MR, where we use phase contrast MR imaging and try to uh, quantify the CSF velocity, the stroke volumes, and the peak systolic as well as the diastolic velocities. So uh, the pulsatile flow thing to remember is that during the cardiac systole, the CSF flows in the caudal direction. And in the diastole, the CSF flows in the cranial direction. So it is in the opposite direction. This is in terms with the Munro Kelly uh, doctrine. And that is because in the systole, the blood flow into the uh, cranial cavity is more. And therefore, the CSF moves in the caudal direction. So that is something to remember. And this is based upon the bidirectional oscillatory movement of the CSF through the aqueduct. So we are not getting into the details of CSF flow studies here, but we can calculate the peak diastolic as well as systolic uh, velocities and the stroke volumes. And there are studies where you have to compare and uh, the control group for your own machine and double that value is now the, considered as a cutoff for the patients for the shunt responsive normal pressure hydrocephalus. So there are various situations where these CSF flow studies are important. One is normal pressure hydrocephalus, very commonly done. Second are areas of hydrocephalus like aqueductal stenosis or where the ventriculostomy has been performed, where they want to know whether it is patent or not. Then intracranial hypertension uh, with asymmetric age inappropriate brain atrophy and also in carry malformations. Now coming to the part of subarachnoid systems or basal systems and their anatomy. So these are the compartments within the subarachnoid space where the pyomatter and the arachnoid membrane are not in close approximation and the CSF pools in this area. So as they are interconnected, their potency is essential for CSF circulation. So blockage anywhere may hamper the normal CSF circulations. And what they normally consist of beyond the CSF are vessels and cranial nerves. So if we see this mid-sagittal graphical image, even on this, at least 11 to 12 of the important uh, cisternal spaces we can identify. So we are going to revise these multiple times uh, in the frequent slides and then we are going to discuss about some relevant clinical aspects. So if these are the central sulcus. Here is the pericalosal cistern which is along the corpus callosum and this is the space where you get those uh, pericalosal lipomas. Interpeduncular cistern, which is somewhere here, it's in the midline, so better seen on axials. Supracellar cisterns, which is around the cella. Prepontine cistern, which is again midline and in front of the pons, ventrally to the pons. Premedullary cistern. Then here we have the parieto occipital sulcal spaces, systems of the velum interpositum. Superior cerebellar system, quadrigeminal system, so which we are going also to see on the actual planes. So this is how a mid-sagittal section of MR T1 weighted image would look like, where you can identify all these external spaces as well as the different CSF recesses. So third ventricle going into the aqueduct, fourth ventricle, quadrigeminal systems, prepontine system, premedullary system, interpeduncular system, supracellular system, all these can be identified clearly on a mid-sagittal image as well. So same thing revised you see here, this mentioned as a system of the lamina terminalis, prismatic system, here is the interpeduncular system, then we come here, which is marked as E, that is the quadrigeminal system, prepontine system, lateral cerebellum medullary system. So as it is a lateral system, it will be better seen on axials or coronals and cisterna magna. So there are multiple uh, images which clearly depict these cisternal spaces on which sagittal as well as axial and different planes. And here again, the same thing which has been described on a MR mid sagittal P2 weighted image. So you see, this is the pericalosal system where you can see the pericalosal lipoma lining up along the same plane. Quadrigeminal system. 
This is the lamina terminalis, the thin line, high point dense line, chiasmatic system, liquid membrane, interpeduncular system, prepontine, premedullary system, and these spaces consist of vessels and cranial nerves. So that also we are going to discuss. So if we try to remember them as dividing them into supratentorial, infratentorial, and lateral system, the supratentorial ones, the important ones are supracellular system superior to the pituitary gland, interpeduncular system, ambient system, then quadrigeminal system, which is under the corpus callosum, splenium behind the pineal gland, tectum, and continuous uh, anteriorly with the vellum interpositum and system of the vellum interpositum. So, uh, same thing, supracellular system, we saw on the mid-sagittal images. Interpeduncular system is this one, which you can see clearly in between ventral portion of the midbrain and this is an unpaired system quadrigeminal system on axial and sagittal and this is uh, where we commonly also find out these quadrigeminal plate lipomas and the end system so we are going to see this uh, particular perimesencephalic systems once again so interpeduncular system crural system ambient system and quadrigeminal systems so these are the contents of these uh, supratentorial systems. Supracellular is in fundibulum optic nerve and circle of phyllis. Interpeduncular is oculomotor nerve, basilar artery, bifurcation and posterior thalamo perforating arteries. Ambient is trochlear nerves and P2 segments of PCA, superior cerebellar artery. Quadrigeminal is pineal gland, trochlear nerve and P3 segment of PCA, vein of gallon and tributaries and system of pelum interpositum is internal cerebral vein. So these are the important contents and because of these particular location, if aneurysm is there involving these segments of the arteries and the rupture happened, the bulk of subarachnoid hemorrhage is going to be located in these particular systems. So that helps us in localizing the site of aneurysm rupture. Infratentorially, the important ones and these are Midline unpaired single systems, prepontine, premedullary, as the names are, so they are easy to locate. Cisterna magna and superior cerebellar system. These are their contents. So prepontine is the main content is basilar artery, cranial nerve five and cranial nerve six. Premedullary is vertebral arteries, anterior spinal arteries, pycas, and cranial nerve twelfth. Superior cerebellar systems, SCA branches. Cisterna magna, the cerebellar tonsils themselves. Cerebellopontine system, so that is cranial of 5th and 7th and 8th. CP angle system, that is in cerebellomedullary system, so which is 9th, 10th, and 11th. Then the paired system, so CP angle, the very uh, famous CP angle system, so commonly seen lesions, they are asked uh, even for the preliminary examinations. So CP angle systems uh, between the enterolateral pons and the cerebellum. Then you have cerebellum medullary system as well, fissures wise, interhemispheric fissure, and cilia and fissures which are separating the frontal and temporal lobes anteriorly. So, this is the cilia system. So, these are all the important cisternal spaces supratentorial, intratentorial, and then the lateral ones. Now, uh, discussing few uh, important points. So, CP angle system is the area where we see the 7th and 8th nerve complexes, where if we perform the dedicated sequences, heavily titubated sequences for the cranial nerves, that is fiesta or cis. And there are multiple lesions which can occur in this particular location. The commonest being the vestibular schonomas, next being the meningiomas or the arachnoid cysts as well. But all of these lesions, including lymphoma, glioma, metastasis, they can happen at this particular site and including the non-enhancing ones like dermoid cyst, lipomas, etc., cholesterol granuloma also can happen close to this area. So this is one of the important cisternal space. Then we have the perimesencephalic systems, which consist of the interpeduncular system, the crural systems here, then the ambient systems and the quadrigeminal plate system. So the interpeduncular and the quadrigeminal systems are the midline unpaired systems, whereas the crural and ambient are the ones which are paired systemal spaces. 
So when you have the subarachnoid space uh, uh, hemorrhage, you're going to see something like this on a CT axial image. And where these are the sylvian systems somewhere here, then the crural, interpeduncular, ambient, quadrigeminal, and in total becoming the perimesencephalic systems. So there is something called as perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is most commonly of non-aneurysmal etiology. So the incidence is about 0.5 per 1 lakh and it's 5% of all subarachnoid hemorrhages and most commonly it is venous in origin rather than arterial so we are not able to get the aneurysms at the side so we have to be carefully looking not only for the aneurysms but also for the venous etiology for these perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhages. So to conclude uh, this talk, the knowledge of physiology of CSF dynamics and anatomy of CSF spaces help in understanding various pathologies as well as the exact radiological description also becomes very easy. So thank you for your patient listening and uh, with this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you all.